Hi, my name is Jen Fern, and I'm the Regional Rehab Coordinator for the Northeast Ontario Stroke Network. I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lynn S. Terkstra, who will be talking about practical strategies for working with stroke patients with cognitive impairments. Dr. Terkstra is a professor at McMaster University, Assistant Dean for Speech Language Pathology, and faculty in the McMaster Neuroscience Graduate Program. She has published extensively on cognitive and communication function after traumatic brain injury, and is co-author of the 2023 textbook, Transforming Cognitive Rehabilitation, with McKay Soberg and Justine Hamilton. Dr. Turkstra was a member of the International INCOG Practice Guidelines Committee for Traumatic Brain Injury Rehabilitation, and is a consultant to the Veterans Health System and Department of Defense for Clinical Practice Guidelines in Mild Traumatic Brain Injury. She lectures nationally and internationally on development of evidence-informed models of cognitive rehabilitation for adolescents and adults with acquired brain injury in acute, subacute, and long-term care settings. Welcome, Dr. Turkstra. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak today on practical strategies for working with stroke patients with cognitive impairments. And I'm very happy to have followed Robin's talk, which had some great strategies. And those are going to just, they set me up really nicely for what I'm going to talk about this morning. So disclosure, in addition to my salary at McMaster University and an honorarium for today's talk, I do, um, as you heard in the introduction, have the second edition of our cognitive rehabilitation text that just came out. Um, if any of you have been involved in working on a book, you know that it's not really a money-making <laughs> proposition, but, um, but still, I will definitely be talking about some principles that are also in the book. I'd like to make a general comment at the beginning about stroke versus other causes of acquired brain injury. The principles that I'll be talking about this morning really apply based on the cognitive profile of the patient, not necessarily the etiology. So if someone has a stroke or has a tumor or has some other reason for a focal lesion of the brain, someone has a heart attack and has a hypoxic injury, really the principles of intervention will carry across all those different etiologies. And that's why I typically choose, like today, to talk about cognitive functions and cognitive impairments rather than talking about a specific etiology. Obviously, the big difference in stroke is that, um, except in the case of our first speaker today, typically it's a uh, large single acute onset event. So that's obviously different than something that progresses over time. But otherwise, the general principles apply. So you know your learner outcomes for today. To summarize common cognitive impairments in people with stroke across severity levels and stages, and to identify some practical strategies. Also, as we're going through today, I encourage you to think about your own style of interacting with patients. And again, I think Robin's talk set this up very well. So to think about anything about your communication behavior that might make it more challenging for a stroke patient with cognitive impairments. I, um, oh, so I'm gonna talk about common cognitive impairments and then summarize what we know about guidelines. So I wanna mention this term, cognitive communication disorder. It's a jargon term that you probably have heard from your speech language pathologists, or if you are an SLP, you know this word. Um, this is a term that was um, created in maybe the 90s, the 1990s, early um, 2000s, became popular to describe the communication problems people have when they don't have aphasia. So what you heard this morning was all about aphasia, which is a primary language problem. But there's lots of cognitive reasons that people can't communicate very well that aren't aphasia. And so this is a sort of a general term for communication problems that come from underlying cognitive impairments. So we say that people with dementia, for example, have cognitive communication disorders, people with right hemisphere strokes, people who have, um, as I mentioned earlier, other etiologies of acquired brain injury that affect their communication ability. 
so that they might have trouble speaking coherently, being socially appropriate, finding words when they mean them, but they don't have aphasia. So that's mostly I'm talking here about people who have underlying cognitive challenges that affect their ability to interact with you and others. So I'm gonna talk about cognitive impairments in three categories, memory, executive functions, and a little bit on social cognition. So let's talk about memory first. I'm gonna show you an old memory model that um, might be familiar to a lot of you. So um, when information from the outside world comes into our brains, if it's conscious information, we hold that in our working memory. Working memory is this limited capacity system where we hold things and manipulate information in our minds. And I'd like to start with it because I feel like working memory load is really a problem for many, many, many patients with stroke, but working memory tends to get overlooked when you think of memory problems in people with stroke. So how does working memory, this ability to hold a bunch of things in your mind, relate to everyday interactions? Um, so actually, you, I, think, I believe you can post in the Q&A if someone might post a sentence that describes their morning I'll ask maybe Sue, I think, um, can get them to me. Is that true, Sue and Bill? Okay, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that's working. So, okay, so I'll give you a sentence. Here's a sentence. I'll give you a sec to read it. So this sentence is in English. It's not very sophisticated vocabulary. Possibly the word betrayed is a, um, a higher level vocabulary word, but otherwise it's, uh, it's really, it's just very plain English words. But this sentence, if you read it and experienced it, this is the experience of a working memory load. So this sentence, because of the grammatical structure of it, you have to hold a lot of things in your mind and move them around mentally to be able to sort it out. This is true of a lot of communication and working memory load can be imposed a couple of ways. One is if you have something that's long and is grammatically complicated. The other is you can say something that's very short, but that requires a lot of inference. So the reason I asked for someone in this previous slide to say, oops, sorry, to say, um, what to describe their morning is you might say something like, um, it took me forever to get here. So the sentence, it took me forever to get here, while it's, it's short and it's not grammatically complicated, there's a lot of information that must be inferred. Like you might infer, oh, I guess the person was driving. You wouldn't think they walked to a conference talk or now we're all at home. So you um, you might think, oh, some things might have happened in their life that would make, take a long time. There's also, and um, it's also implied that there was something um, that delayed the person that typically it would take them less time to get here. So a sentence that you say can have a lot of mental work in it because it's long and complicated or because it is short and requires a lot of information to be inferred by the listener. So working memory load is actually uh, one of the big challenges for a lot of patients with stroke. So in your communication with patients, one thing to think about is to make it simple and short. That doesn't mean patronizing and childlike. It just means perhaps think and plan a bit before you say a sentence. I'm famous for garden path sentences that wander all over and have embedded clauses and change direction. And usually that's really difficult for people to understand. So that's practical strategy number one. Try and keep your language 
simple and short. Hello, Lynn. I'm back. Hi, Sue. <laughs> I apologize for missing your question. There was a few people that did type in the chat and I'm ah. here for the go now. Would you okay. like your answers or we'll just wait for the next one? We'll just wait for the next one. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. And thanks for those of you who typed in the chat. <laughs> okay, so then long-term memory. Um, once information is in our working memory, if we're trying to store it, we could store it in long-term memory. So there are two types of long-term memory. Again, this is information a lot of you will know. There's the kind of long-term memories that you have and you can talk about. Those are called declarative because you can declare them. And there are types of memories that actually go into your memory storage without They're automatically encoded just by repetition. Those are weak I'm calling non-declarative memories. Some people call them implicit versus explicit for declarative memories. You'll hear people call this procedural memory and learning. I'm calling it non-declarative because procedures are part of it, but another really big part is emotional associations. We form emotional associations, feelings attached to people and events without being conscious of having done that. I remember when a million years ago, I was a student at McMaster and the um, professor in psychology gave this example of walking by someone in a hallway as an adult and feeling this sort of rush of, of lust, he said. And when he tracked back, he realized this person had been wearing a perfume, I believe, that was worn by a girl he had a crush on in high school. And he'd never consciously memorized that perfume, but somehow it was stored in his mind. This is why people will say, if you're trying to sell a house, bake cookies. So just people have these positive emotional associations. It's not just with places and events, though, it is also with people. And as an example, I like to use um, naming a baby. So when someone names a baby, when they are proposing names for a baby, everyone has an opinion about what name they want or they don't want. And those opinions are really based on some memory you might not even be conscious of, that you like some name or you don't like some name. It's because you've made this sort of feeling attachment. And I emphasize this because in stroke patients and other patients with, when we say memory problems, typically the problems patients have are in declarative conscious learning. I don't remember what I had for breakfast today. I don't remember where I was last week. I can't rem remember an upcoming appointment. It's very, very rarely that people have non-declarative habit and skill memory impairments. And what that means, though, is sometimes non-declarative memories are being formed without declarative memories being able to put them in context. So, for example, you might feel really annoyed. So let's say you're driving home from work. You're feeling really annoyed because you all have good declarative memory. You can think, I've got this feeling, but let me track back through my day and think about what it was that annoyed me. So you can use your declarative memory to put that gut feeling, that, that procedural, non-declarative habit side of memory in context. A person who doesn't have that can just have the bad feeling and direct it at whoever happens to be in the immediate area. And so this dominance of non-declarative learning and memory over declarative learning and memory happens in a lot of patients um, with cognitive impairments related to stroke. So to just recap the characteristics of these memory types, so declarative learning, so learn, getting things into your memory and storing them in your memory are dependent, uh, that process is dependent on conscious experience to encode and recall. Today you're at this talk, you are hopefully conscious, you might be writing notes down, you might be thinking about it, you might be making semantic associations. I'm trying to give you examples to help you link this to things you already know so that I'm helping you store it by giving you semantic associations. You can screw up or misremember, but sometimes you can learn something consciously only once if the consequences are really bad. So I always give the example of having backed my husband's truck into a tree the first time I drove it. I only needed to do that once. 
it was very expensive. I, obviously, it's been many years and I'm still talking about it. So I, it, it had big consequences and it was very memorable. So, and you can generalize that. So I'm hoping today you might think, hmm, short and simple, short and simple. I can maybe take that uh, Monday when I'm working with patients with cognitive impairments and think about generalizing it to my everyday situation. This is quite different from non-declarative memories. You might be able to operate the ATM, but you might not remember exactly what the muscle movements are. You might remember the event when someone taught it to you, but you might have evolved this sort of automatic um, motor behavior that's not really accessible to your conscious recall in terms of like the muscles or the sequences. It's stored by surface features. So you have your ATM routine for your ATM and you go to a different ATM that has a different layout, it will mess you up, especially now we're all having cross-platform confusion. So it's touch screen versus buttons for a credit card, the taps on the front of the machine versus the back of the machine. Sometimes it has to be swiped. I mean, it's we are all having this confusion. So you could think of when the next time that you can't figure out where to put your credit card on a tap machine, you might think, oh, that's because it, I stored this as a non-declarative memory stored by super surface features, highly context specific and learning is probabilistic. That one is key because it means whatever you do the most is what you learn. So if you are asked by healthcare staff questions and you don't know the answer and you say, I don't know, what you might learn is not the right answer, but the I don't know response. So whatever you practice a lot is what you learn. And it's very durable over time. Hence the expression, it's hard to break a bad habit. So practical strategy number two is, if a patient has declarative learning and memory imp impairments and is having what people, at least on inpatient, people will say, oh, the patient's having a bad day or they got up on the wrong side of the bed, consider non-declarative emotional associations. Maybe what happened is they had some negative interaction or some negative experience at the beginning of the day and that changed their mood. They don't have the declarative memory to put it in context and so they're just in a bad mood and what the way you think about it instead of thinking oh I'll try and talk them out of it you think this is a mathematical problem they need to have more positive emotional associations than negative. So how can we make their next interactions be positive? I can tell you this is this was a profound change for me working um, in dementia uh, when my mom had dementia because it completely changed how we interacted with her. We focused 100% of our efforts on positive emotional associations. So if she started talking about something negative, we just changed the subject to something positive or changed an activity to something positive. So we really focused on positive emotional associations. Before I knew this, I was in many conversations with patients where I would try and talk them out of a bad mood. And really, if people have declarative learning and memory problems, that's not very effective. Um, this is a note just to say that you get better, this is errors, so you get better at learning non-declarative memories as you get older, uh, sorry, declarative memories, you get better as you get older, but non-declarative memories, they actually come online very young and they're pretty stable across the lifespan. So what you see here is that people get a little bit slower um, in their habits and skills, but you can count on this procedural learning and memory as being really good throughout a person's entire life. Now, in everyday thinking, it's hard to dissociate these two. So, for example, to say please, you learned it probably consciously, your parents taught you, but you just know it automatically. We have greetings in, um, in our local culture, for example, that evolve over time. So, like, if you say, um, hi, how's it going? And the other person says, I'm good. This is actually relatively new in the last few years. I'm good. No one probably taught you to say, I'm good. And if you think about it, it's a pretty egotistical response <laughs> to say, I'm good. Like I'm self-evaluating. I think everything's great. Um, but you just picked it up. So th that's clearly something that's non-declarative. But when you get to a work task, like answering a phone and taking messages, parts of that are probably automatic. I'm going like this for a phone, but that hasn't been a phone for many years. 
Um, so I should be like answering a phone. Um, that's, you know, some parts are declarative, some are non-declarative. Or like today, um, you're in a webinar, we've all evolved a whole new set of declarative and non-declarative behaviors for participating in online. So in patients with stroke and other etiologies of acquired brain injury, declarative learning is often impaired and non-declarative is mostly preserved. So why is that? Well, um, it comes back really to anatomy. So declarative memory is highly dependent on temporal lobe structures, especially the hippocampus and regions around the hippocampus. The hippocampus and parahippocampal structures have the highest metabolic rate in the brain. So they're high oxygen demanding um, neurons. And when people have a loss of oxygen, it tends to affect this part of the brain. So this is also, for example, if people faint, they might not remember a couple of minutes before they faint. People have uh, temporal lobe seizures. They might lose minutes, hours, even a day um, prior to the seizure because those memories are still being encoded. So this is quite vulnerable to loss of blood flow, loss of oxygen. Non-declarative learning and memory, when people don't know where these things are in the brain or what brain structures are critical, they typically say subcortical or basal ganglia. So, um, but these seem to be dependent on um, evolutionarily older structures in the brain. So basal ganglia, cerebellum. Um, and so those parts of the brain tend to not be as vulnerable to events like events in stroke where a patient loses oxygen. So how does that play out in everyday interactions with patients? So a, a, a master's student, when I was at the University of Wisconsin, did her thesis on this, and she went and sat in the room of five patients. These are patients with brain injury who were in post-traumatic amnesia. The definition of post-traumatic amnesia is that you have impaired declarative learning. So you would expect that people would not be able to consciously remember things. And this is what she found over a day. First of all, look at the number of questions, oops, sorry, the number of questions that patients were asked. That's a lot of questions for a single day each, but the more concerning was that some questions did not have answers that anyone could verify if the patient said the correct answer. So for example, one, uh, a person asked a patient, did you used to use a bus pass before um, you were in the hospital? There's no way to know if that's accurate or not accurate. And so that's something to think about when you're interacting with patients with memory problems. First of all, how many questions do you ask them? And second, are they the kinds of questions that you won't know if the patient is giving you the correct answer or not? So based on that study and other findings, a group at Moss Rehab Research Institute in Pennsylvania um, created a method for managing patients, trained staff in a method for managing patients. And it, what they did was, um, oh, and this is the paper that we published on that. Um, we developed a clinical protocol. So the clinical protocol was basically to reduce the number of information seeking questions that you ask the patient and have more in the moment type questions for the patient if you have to ask them at all. And it was uh, tried on four patients. So basically staff were trained, four patients were, um, the, the, before staff training, we evaluated staff interactions with four patients, then staff were trained, then we evaluated interactions with four different patients. And this is what you can see. So pre-training, there were a lot of questions. And by the way, this is per hour, per hour. There are a lot of questions about the patient's state, which is what you want. So that's, are you cold? Are you in pain? Um, are you hungry? There were this uh, number, about four questions on average per hour that were quizzing questions. That's when the clinician or the staff person knows the answer and they're testing the patient. And then there were this number, this is the problem number here, of asking information that you can't confirm. So then everyone was trained with the PTA protocol, and you can see what happened afterward was that the quiz questions went to zero, the information questions went almost to zero, and even the state questions dropped a bit as people realized how many questions they were asking in a day. Anecdotally, this was tried on the brain injury unit, but the stroke unit 
adopted it. So someone must have come down and seen it. Um, we have signs on the brain injury unit that say PTA protocol, it's an orange sign. And someone was going by the stroke unit and saw a sign on the wall that said, don't ask questions. <laughs> So, so clearly it had sort of spread around the hospital. Also, therapists really loved it because they felt that the patients were in a better mood. It's kind of interesting. So practical strategy number three, ask one question. Does this person have declarative learning and memory impairments? If they do, maybe consider not asking a lot more questions. Instead, perhaps focus on the here and now, and um, get information from someone who can give you reliable information. One of the things that drives me a bit buggy is the name thing. So people's names are impossible to remember for everyone. They're arbitrary. They have absolutely no semantic association with the person. The strategies of uh, associate this name with, like Sue is someone I would never sue. Like that, that doesn't really, it's not, they're not really effective strategies, especially for people who already have cognitive impairments and then have to remember a strategy. So I wish people would just wear more name tags and wear them not on a lanyard, but wear them like people did with the portrait project during COVID, like up here where someone can actually see your name. Executive functions are the next area of cognition I'm gonna mention. And executive functions have gone by lots of names over the years, planning, self-control, attention, switching. I like the model that was proposed by Diamond in 2013. Um, Adele Diamond is a researcher at University of British Columbia. She's been in this field making major contributions for many decades. She divides executive function into three First of all, you have to be flexible. You have to have mental flexibility. Second, you have to be able to control your thoughts, control your actions. And third, you need to have some mental space to do those things. To give you a sense of that, imagine you're planning your day. If you were planning your, or say today, you're planning your weekend. If you're planning your weekend, you're probably juggling things around in your mind. You have to focus on what you're thinking of and not other things around you that might be distracting, background noises, other tasks you should be doing, the fact that maybe your stomach is growling. Those are all things you have to block out. So you need the mental control. And then you need to be able to shuffle things in your mind according to constraints. So perhaps you think, oh, I'm gonna go to the store in the afternoon, but then, I heard that it might snow, so now I'm gonna have to do that in the morning. So you can see how you have to be flexible, have mental control, and then you have to have a mental workspace to do all that, that computation in. Executive function development parallels brain development. So it begins the first time you're manipulated by a toddler. You can see they're developing executive function. Um, I think the term three-nager comes from the fact that three-year-olds are developing executive function, but they're not very good at it. Uh, so they, they're kind of trying to manipulate you, but they're really obvious about it. And it's kind of annoying. So it develops into the 20s and then sadly starts to decline um, in the after the 40s. So it's variable in the general population. Um, you know, you are all uh, showing outstanding executive function because you're here at this conference today at this webinar and what it took for you to get here is a lot of executive function. If it's interrupted, it can fail to develop. So children with very young injuries can actually fail to develop the ability to control their own behavior or be flexible. And as I alluded to, it's, we call it last in first out. So if you're in the webinar and you are between about age 25 and 40, you're in your peak executive function years. And those of us who are slightly outside that range are probably more distracted by things than we were when we were younger. I wanna mention control specifically because it's so relevant to um, working with people with cognitive impairments after stroke. There's a concept in the control literature called self-regulation. It's actually talked about mostly in health uh, research, health psychology, um, and also in marketing. 
Self-regulation is your ability to control yourself, as you would imagine. Health psychology is very interested in this because they're trying to get people to exercise and quit smoking and eat better. So that's, that's where this self ability to regulate your own behavior comes in. Marketing is very interested in it because they're trying to decrease the number of decisions you have to make when you're shopping. So if you are shopping and you're overwhelmed, you will not spend as much money. So the marketing people are doing things like making sure every grocery store has produce at one end and frozen food at the other end, because they know that's the sequence people will shop. If your store mixes it up, you will be overwhelmed and you will spend less. It's also the reason you get suggestions on Amazon. If you buy anything or on any website, other people also liked this because they're trying to decrease the number of decisions you have to make so you spend more money. This is all based on a model that self-regulation, your ability to control yourself is limited. So we each have a limited capacity for control and we can use it up. So self-control is fatigable. And um, I put this cake here because I think a lot of us think of it in terms of dieting. When you say I fell off the wagon or, you know, I had to, I have a cheat day or what all this is because self-control is not an infinite resource. Where this comes into play with uh, patients with stroke is that they already have to work harder to think. And so it's common for people to run out of mental energy. So mental energy is really self-regulation because you're having to make your mind apply to performing a task. So self-regulation fatigue is a common problem in people with executive function impairments. And you will hear patients say, I ran out of thinking energy. I hit the mental wall. I couldn't think anymore. You might feel that way at the end of the day. That would be very typical. Um, also though, it means that people tend to fall apart when they're tired, stressed, or multitasking. This is true for all of us, but I think sometimes it's underestimated in people with stroke. So in the inpatient unit, it's like we recognize that people need a break, but sometimes that break is just parking them in their room with the TV on. It's, it's not everyone's strategies for, for dealing with self-regulation are different. And so thinking about, is this person's behavior because they're done, because they're just mentally done, or is it because they're having medication side effects or because they're feeling nauseated? And how can we understand how to structure activities to take advantage of when the person is feeling more, for lack of a better term, recharged? So you think about it, this self-regulation fatigue is common in everyone. We all have it. But what would it be like if you already had executive function impairments and then you had to control yourself? So you have executive function impairments, but then you're also on the inpatient unit or you're coming for outpatient therapy and you're expected to have socially appropriate behavior or expected to respond or expected to focus on multiple directions. Um, it, it can be the self-regulation, I find, again, is just a very useful concept. So the practical strategy number four is if you see that the patient's performance is not what you would expect or the family is talking about struggles at home, think about whether it's possible the patient has self-regulation fatigue. If they do, is there a way that you can provide environmental supports to reduce self-regulation demands? So in other words, can you make a day more structured so that the person doesn't have to think about what their activities are all the time? And can you ask the person, what is a break for them? And a lot of what we do in cognitive rehab is help people learn when they're running out of mental energy and implement their own breaks and let other people know, I can't talk to you right now. It's too much work. I need to sit quietly. Last quick topic here is social cognition. So social cognition, this is my area of research. It's the cognitive processes we use to navigate the social world. And it's basically three kinds of processes. It's the mental functions we use to understand other people, ourselves, and, to, and ourselves, and to know what's appropriate social knowledge. So I just wanna talk for a minute about this. 
there's become increasing evidence over the last two decades that many patients with stroke are, are not very good, <clears throat> sorry, at reading other people. And that comes in two flavors, people who actually struggle to read emotions from other people's faces, which in the lab we test by showing photographs and asking the person, what do you think this person is feeling? The results of that have shown that in general, when people with any kind of acquired brain injury have difficulty reading other people, they have difficulty with the emotions that are hardest for everyone. So happiness is easy. Everyone can, can read happiness in another person's face. What's trickier is to tell the difference, for example, between angry and afraid. So fear versus surprise is a very difficult uh, differentiation for everybody. Probably, I always say it's because in the animal kingdom, there are no happy surprises. So fear and surprise should be connected. Um, but it's those types of emotions that seem to be most difficult. I see people who, who say overestimate the extent to which someone is angry or underestimate to the extent to which someone is angry. So I know my wife is furious at me, but she's not really furious. She's irritated. So you see this, these kinds of emotion challenges. And I think this is behind some of the family conflicts that we might see in people with stroke and other acquired brain injuries. These are just a couple of pa papers that have shown emotion recognition in stroke patients. Um, and you can see by the date of the second one, this 2020, um, and even the first one, 2013, that this is a fairly recent literature. So practical strategy number four would be ask if the patient has impairments in reading emotions. We don't have a good test right now. And you can imagine from hearing Robin's talk, if someone has aphasia, it's, it's really, really difficult. So you might end up just asking family members or even simulating some emotions yourself and seeing if the person can get what you're showing on your face. And at a previous, um, when I worked with a previous team and we implemented something called say what you feel. So educate the family to not ask the person to guess how they're feeling, but to just say. So instead of coming in the door with a sad expression and expecting your family member to understand that you're sad, to come in the door and say, I'm sad. The second part of social cognition is theory of mind. That's your mind reading ability. So which none of us can do now when we're in webinars. So I can't see any of you. I can't tell if you're following or if you're interested. Um, so typically as a teacher, I would be looking at everyone and trying to figure out, are they, um, are they falling asleep? Are they engaged in the topic? So that's theory of mind. Um, quite a bit of evidence. Again, if you look at the years, you can see this is fairly recent, showing that theory of mind is impaired in stroke. Um, it's a classic in people with the right hemisphere stroke to not be able to really put yourself in another person's shoes, so to speak. Um, but it's also been seen in some patients with left hemisphere strokes, some with bilateral strokes. It doesn't seem to be dependent on having a frontal lobe lesion. So, um, so again, this is probably more common than we know, but we don't have good tests for it yet. So practical strategy number five might be consider that the patient might not be good at mind reading. And if they're not, consider educating the family and team to have to say what they think. So the full thing, the full expression that we did in the previous team um, that I worked with in Alabama was say what you feel, say what you think. So if you think your family member maybe isn't that good at reading the expression on your face and maybe isn't that good at inferring what you're thinking, could you, as the family person, say what you feel, say what you think? So this is the point where I encourage you to reflect on your own style of interacting with patients with cognitive impairments after stroke and think about one thing that you could try on your next work day. So I'm gonna switch gears for the last few minutes and talk about rehab. And this is short because there's not a lot of data for stroke. So 
the topic here could be what's the current evidence related to cognitive rehabilitation, which means, am I going to fix your thinking through rehabilitation? Or how can I rehab a person who has cognitive impairments? Those are really different things. So if I'm a physio, I'm working with a patient who has memory problems, all the things that I talked about earlier apply across physio. You can think about, am I giving multi-step commands? Am I using my facial expression to show whether a person is achieving their treatment targets? That's all applicable to patients with cognitive impairments. But there is this other side of what can we do if the patient has cognitive rehabilitation, uh, cognitive impairments? Is there anything that we can do to repair or help the patients recover from their memory problems, their executive function problems, or their social cognition problems? So I looked in preparation for this talk because stroke is not my main area. So I looked at guidelines from Europe. I looked at guidelines from Canada. I looked at consensus international guidelines at the heart and stroke, stroke best practices for some guidance about what, what is the evidence for improving cognition per se, and it's crickets. So they're really, it's not, it's hardly mentioned so there's a lot of acknowledgement that people have cognitive impairments, but there's almost no evidence of what helps. So I'm going to share, oh, sorry, this is a paper that came out in 2020. I'm going to share some general practice guidelines, um, and I will make this comment first. Right now, we seem to be in an era where it's fashionable to put people on a computer to train or retrain their cognitive function. There are many companies doing this right now. They have a lot of money. For those of you in Northeastern Ontario, there are a lot of um, vendors who are capitalizing on individuals who are in rural and remote locations who might not have access to in-person uh, rehabilitation to sell computer type programs. Um, this meta-analysis was done in 2020, and I can tell you the results have not changed showing that people get better on the games, but there is not strong evidence of generalization to everyday life. So it doesn't appear we are fixing cognitive functions. It appears we are training skills and habits on cognitive software. Now, a patient might learn a strategy that they use in the software and then apply it in their everyday life, but most people don't have the metacognitive skills to be able to say, oh, I noticed when I'm on the computer game, I turn off the TV and other environmental distractions to help me focus. So now I'm going to turn off the TV and other environmental distractions all the time. Um, that's not the that's not generally how it works. So the computer stuff, the evidence right now is poor. So I'm just going to mention three principles of intervention. First, I wish we could stop saying restorative versus compensatory. I hear this all the time. We're going to do a restorative treatment, let's say computer exercises. And if that doesn't work, we're going to use a strategy like post-its. This is not a service to patients. When we say either or and we say compensatory, it sounds like we have given up. And so that means people don't want to use strategies. It's also not biological. People's brains are changing all the time. Their, their brains are changing from the second after they have the stroke. People are developing mental strategies right from the beginning. And when people use strategies, things about their basic cognitive functions improve. So it's not a biological distinction. So we tend to say we are doing strategy training to improve your function in everyday life. And we don't, and you know, yes, maybe your memory will get better, but the bottom line is you're actually going to be able to find your keys. Second, and this comes from Ora Kagan, who was the original founder of the Aphasia Institute, we start with the end. So you think about what is it that the person wants? That's how we set our treatment targets. We don't set them based on, I'm going to improve your memory by 20%. We say, what is it that you want to do in your life and how can we work backwards? That's consistent with the World Health Organization classification functioning. And focusing on participation. Third, this is so obvious, you all know it, is treat the person, not the problem. So again, I'm going to help you, the person with cognitive impairments, achieve your everyday life. I am not going to necessarily treat your memory like a muscle and see if I can just improve it all by itself. So with that, here are the recommended practices in cognitive rehab, not in stroke. 
an acquired brain injury that's not stroke. Three general types of cognitive rehabilitation, the muscle type, working on my executive function so it gets better, mostly working memory. It's a lot of exercises for working memory out there, strategies and habits and skills. And I'm gonna say, this is rehab for people with cognitive impairments. Generally, as I mentioned, working memory is a big target of the exercise type approach in cognitive rehab. Also attention, mostly executive attention, so controlling your attention. And there's executive function and social cognition training as well. Results so far, not great. So as I mentioned, they don't tend to generalize onto untrained tasks in everyday life. Sometimes too, spending time on the computer can take you away from things that will help you, like having conversations with your family. The strategies, the evidence is fantastic. People can learn to use strategies, but the person has to know when to use the strategy, so that takes awareness. Or you have to make it a habit so that the strategy, the person is cued to use it automatically, which means it takes a lot of practice. So a therapy session once a week for 50 minutes is not going to cut it. Third is habits and skills, which is related. So again, amazing that people can relearn because most people with stroke have good procedural learning and memory. They can learn a lot of habits, but with the caveat that it's probabilistic. People will learn what they do the most. So again, if they're only seeing you as a therapist once a week, they're gonna have a lot of opportunities to practice something that's perhaps not what you train. So you have to build in lots of repetition and it's context specific. So the person is not spontaneously gonna generalize from one ATM to another. So just to recap the practical strategies, keep it simple and short if you can in your communication. Um, Think about whether this person has declarative learning or memory problems, and if they do, maybe consider not asking them a lot of questions. Consider self-regulation and self-regulation fatigue, and if the person is maybe showing mental fatigue and that's why their performance is not doing very well, ask yourself if the person has trouble recognizing emotions or reading the minds of other people. If they do, consider saying what you think and saying what you feel in instead of expecting the person to do that. Oops, sorry, I didn't realize those animated. So the take home message is you can do this. It's not uh, really complicated. Name tags are super easy. I'm just making my name tag pitch today. Um, you can do it, we can help. And that's also our motto for working with patients with cognitive impairments. We're, it's a coaching model. We're here to support patients. We want them to be able to do what they need to do in their everyday lives. So I will stop there and give you some time for questions. Very good. Thank you so much, Lynn. Again, I apologize for stepping out. Um, too much coffee in the morning, but um, it was a really great presentation. I'll ask people to take a few minutes to um, type their questions into the ask a question box and I can relate them to Lynn. Um, also a reminder to click on the bottom right hand corner on the evaluation for this specific session. It just takes a minute and it really uh, helps us to improve uh, going forward. Uh, there is a question in the chat about receiving the slides for this presentation. So I have sent them out. And um, I sent them out in two emails. One was a link to um, a site where you could download about four of them. And then last night I sent the rest that I received. So if you still haven't received them, just uh, pop your name in the chat and say handouts, and I will ensure that they get sent to you again. Um, so, um, I wanted to ask about doing repetition, Lynn, and uh, when you're doing repetition with somebody, do you try and avoid them making errors? I just watched something recently about that, and so it just struck me that we're talking about repetition and doing things over and over to become a habit, but what if they're making errors? How would you manage that? So for patients with declarative learning impairments who have good non-declarative learning, we often use error control methods. You might, Sue, you might've been um, hearing a presentation on errorless learning. 
So we do a lot of errorless learning, which um, it's our, our model for that is don't ask, just tell. So we took that sort of from the military opposite of the military model. <laughs> so instead of asking the person to try, um, if they make an error, you tell them the correct answer, ask them to repeat it. Um, and there's a whole training method for that, spaced retrieval training that ha that's manualized. Um, there's an actual spaced retrieval training manual. Uh, we have some forms in our book too. We talk about it a lot. So it depends on the patient. So if it's a patient who has good declarative learning and memory, of course, you'd want them to have an opportunity to do trial and error learning. But if they don't, then you, you probably want to control how much they make errors. So just telling them the correct answer. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, when you talked about uh, setting up structure for a day uh, for somebody setting up their structure, is there a specific app you use or a specific way that you do that for that strategy? No, it's very individualized. So, um, so I work in cognitive rehabilitation. And so for us, but I'm working with people who have milder cognitive problems. In general, we look at the person and what their needs are for the day. Some people like an app. Um, and that's everything from a Google calendar all the way up to some pretty sophisticated, dedicated apps. There's actually an app um, called Pace My Day, um, which is a really, uh, it's a really nice app. If you Google Pace My Day, you will get to the website of Michelle Wild, a psychologist in the United States. She works with a lot of people with brain injury. She has for 30 years. And she's developed some apps to help people sort of organize and also monitor things like your fatigue level throughout the day. So there are some people mm -hmm. who like a sophisticated app like that um, and other people who would like it on the fridge on a piece of paper right. with a magnet. <laughs> yeah, that could be me. <laughs> Great. Um, the other thing I want to ask about was, uh, what do you use to educate families on social cognition with respect to their emotions? We have, so um, when I worked with the, the team at Spain Rehab at University of Alabama at Birmingham, we created a handout. I'm happy to share that with people. So our experience was that families are so stressed around the time of discharge that they couldn't have a lot. So we just created a one pager um, for families. So I am happy to, mm -hmm. to do that rather than like a full training families. We just gave them like a one page handout on what are some signs? Um, and how do you, how do you, what, you know, how do you say what you feel, say what you think? So Sue, I can email that to you if you want to share it with the group and people are free right. to take whatever, modify it. You don't have to credit us. It's not okay. rocket science. Yeah, if you send it to me, I'll ensure it's attached to um, an email to people next week. Um, I was a bit surprised about um, the lack of evidence on the cognitive research and uh, me too. treatment research. And so I don't know if you have anything else you can share with us about that. It just, and, and I'm not sure how people feel in the audience, but to me, that was a bit shocking. I thought that there was plenty of research on cognition. Um, so maybe you can just... Yeah speak to that a little bit for me there's I mean there's plenty of research documenting cognitive problems but I think the problem is that the studies in general are poorly done so if you look at the guidelines I think I'm, I'm I'll have to go back and recheck the Canadian guidelines but I think often the studies that are out there don't meet the criteria to be included in guidelines because they're not controlled studies or right. or one of the things that's really frustrating um, I work with a group on, um, on a framework for describing rehabilitation treatments. And one of the things that's very frustrating is you see a paper where someone did some, a program that included education and training and group work and individual sessions, and it was 10 weeks and overall people got better, but you have no idea what part of that was responsible for the change. And then if you're in a setting, which most of us are, where no one's going to get that, you know, that's like a university clinic where people are coming for free for 10 weeks, but nobody in the rest of the world is going to get that. We don't know which part of it we have to replicate because we can't tell where the benefit came from. So right. I think that's, I think that the cognitive rehabilitation literature is just really um, undeveloped, I would say. Yeah, interesting. Um, and just as 
go back to repetition for a minute. Um, you know, I, I noticed you said, you know, one hour a week in therapy is not going to be enough. And I know from my experience on our inpatient unit, it's five days a week. Um, but is there a way to um, continue that repetition after hours? So back in their room or with their family or with the nurse in the evening or something like that? So um, this will probably, this might be a controversial, <laughs> this be a oh, controversial hey, suggestion, <laughs> but I don't think inpatient is the time to do it. Okay. So I think inpatient is the time to control errors because I will see people outpatient who repeated behavior, negative behavior so much on inpatient that now they have a habit. Right. Um, but I think that where people need to have the high repetition is on things they're going to actually do in their everyday life. So when they're out there, like so many patients have said, well, of course, I don't know my schedule. Like it's on the arm of my wheelchair. <laughs> that is not how it's going to be. Or, or teaching people how to use a memory book when they're on inpatient that they're never going to use when they go back on outpatient again. And so I'm not, I'm actually not a big proponent of inpatient cognitive rehabilitation. I think the team on inpatient's job is to help support that person interacting with others and help support therapists um, in having the patient not learn bad habits and have positive interactions with people so that when they are discharged from therapy, um, they think therapy is good. I'm saying that as an SLP because often people are discharged from therapy and they, they hate us because we're the people who took away their food. Right. We don't want to be that person. And for the OTs, you took away their driving. Yeah, we, right. we, know, we know the stories. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll just uh, give one more minute. If anyone else wants to type a question into the ask a question box, um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. But uh, it was a really, really great talk, really informative. And I'm so pleased that you could join us today, Lynn, and, and share your thoughts with us. Um, when we uh, finish this session, we're going to go to break. So uh, that'll be great. And we will start our next session at uh, exactly at 1115 this morning. So I'll just check for any more questions from anyone in the audience. I think we have about 70 or so people watching right now. So I know you can't see anybody, but there, <laughs> there is Thanks. a number of people out there. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank I think we're much. good. We have no more questions. So again, Lynn, thanks a lot and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the day.